May is Brain Tumor Awareness Month. In today's In Depth, we take a look at this deadly cancer and speak with a survivor who devised the odds every day that he wakes up. First, let's take a look at the numbers. The American Cancer Society's most recent estimates for brain and spinal cord tumors in the U.S. last year show more than 22,000 malignant tumors of the brain or spinal cord were diagnosed. Nearly 13,000 people died from those tumors in 2009. Both adults and children are included in those stats. Now, overall, the chance of a person developing a malignant tumor of the brain or spinal cord in his or her lifetime is less than 1%, specifically about 1 in 150 for a man and 1 in 185 for a woman. Survival rates can vary widely depending upon the type of tumor. And joining me right now is Robert Gibbs. Robert has been on the program with us before, a six-year survivor of brain cancer. The fact that you're back is absolutely wonderful because it's been a while since we had actually talked. Glad to be back. And this is Brain Tumor Awareness Month. Now, you pointed out as we were sitting here talking that just because you have a brain tumor does not mean it's cancerous. What percentage end up being cancerous? Do we know? Uh, it, it, it depends, you know, because there's over 120 different types of uh, actual brain tumors which make treatment very difficult. So. Oh, boy. Yeah. Now, tell us about the Miles for Hope organization, then we're going to get back to your story. Uh, Miles for Hope was founded uh, about a year and a half ago by my wife and I, and we're dedicated to funding cutting-edge treatments and finding really better, uh, safer treatments that provide for a better quality of life for brain cancer patients. All right, you're a six-year survivor. How did you find out that you had brain cancer? Uh, actually, I had, uh, was having visual seizures at the time. That's how I was diagnosed with uh, brain cancer. Uh, you know, seeing a kaleidoscope of colors, and you just knew something wasn't right. Had headaches, and went to Meese Dunedin, and they... I guess luckily found the uh, found the brain tumor. Okay, so what kind of surgery did you have to have? I had two uh, open craniectomies, uh, eleven rounds of chemotherapy, and an experimental vaccine. And did the vaccine work? Obviously, uh, absolutely. I'm two years cancer free. I actually go for an MRI again today. Now, one of the problems with with brain cancer, first of all, is when I hear brain cancer, I automatically think right or wrong, this person doesn't have very long to live. Uh, that's typically correct. The average median survival with grade four brain cancer, as we saw with Senator Kennedy, was 14 and a half months. Oh boy, are we getting better with our treatments? With the uh, st current treatments, no. With clinical trials uh, such as the vaccine that I'm on, yes, they are showing promise. It's actually taken that 14 and a half month median survival and extended that to over 36 months now. Now, I always ask the question: Why then, if it works, why aren't we seeing it used more often? Uh, unfortunately, FDA, with you know a lot of the uh, you know measures that they have in place, it takes a long time for these uh, clinical trials to make make, it, make their way through FDA. And not only that, then if it doesn't make its way through FDA, that means insurance companies won't pay for it. That's correct. Okay, we are here today to talk to you about something that's almost revolutionary in terms of treating brain tumors. I didn't realize that you are putting together something called a tumor tissue bank. Now, what is that? That's correct. Uh, one thing we looked at, so many people were contacting us, you know, wanting to know how they can get on the vaccine that I'm on, and the vaccine that I received is actually made with a patient's own brain tumor tissue. So we started looking into it, saying, well, there's got to be a way to save this tumor tissue, you know, after surgeries it's being disposed of. Not only that, we've recently read that there's actually chemosensitivity testing that they could, they could, they could actually do on the tumor tissue, mm -hmm. which will actually tell, based on the patient's own tumor tissue, what chemotherapy, you know, chemotherapy agent would respond best to that type of tumor. Now, do they use this technique with other tumors beyond brain tumors? The tumor banking is open for all types of tumor tissue. And how new is that? Uh, we just released the information last week. Oh, wow. So we're talking ex extremely new. Brand new. Okay, no, so uh, walk me through this scientifically. So you keep the tissue from the tumor, uh, but the tumor has already been removed from your brain, so how does that help? It helps because uh, once that tumor tissue is processed at the uh, laboratory, there's several things. Uh, it creates a more personalized treatment approach. By that, I mean uh, the tumor tissue could actually be tested uh, genetically to determine, you know, what uh, composition the tumor, you know, was made compromised of or made up of. Right. In addition to that, they could actually take that tumor tissue and test the different chemotherapy, ag chemotherapy agents on it. And this is happening with a lot of other things called designer drugs or designer treatment. Designer treatment, personalized okay. treatments. Obviously, you went through the experimental treatment with the vaccine. I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you in your head go, oh boy, they're, they're going to experiment on me? It's uh, initially when I was diagnosed, I was totally against, you know, any type of uh, clinical trial. You know, I, I didn't want to be a human guinea pig. Right. But the more I researched and found out about the, the vaccine trial that I was on, it was made with my own tumor tissue. It was made with my own, blood, you know, white blood cells. Right. So it wasn't, quote, unquote, an, you know, uh, you know, a typical what I consider a clinical trial, you know, with testing different toxic agents or anything like that. Right, yeah. So that in itself intrigued me because if you look back in history, what's cure disease? It's always been a vaccine. 
So wow. you know that that really you know uh, you know interest you know intrigued me, and did we decide to go ahead and give it a try? And they're trying to do that with other things. I, I have to tell a personal story that I lost my father to uh, to uh, cancer, and he was on interferon one, two, and three, mm -hmm. all three of them, and uh, extended his life for a few years, but right. uh, inevitably uh, did not work out. So uh, the cost of this tumor tissue, uh, who, well, we know that insurance companies don't cover it yet, but how much is it? It's about the same cost as banking cord blood. You know, everybody knows about the cord bl blood banking. It's uh, 19.95 for the you know the first year and the you know in the process to uh, you know that's required to go ahead and you know process the tumor tissue so it's 1,995 dollars and then the you know the of course the testing for the genetics and the chemosensitivity would be on top of that right but that's a very reasonable cost you know given the uh, you know fact that chemotherapy runs 50 60 thousand a month so how do you let more people know about it besides appearing on our in-depth segment here on Bay News 9 uh, that's exactly how we let more people know about it. <laughs> You know, by getting out, uh, you know, hopefully we can get some national, you know, attention on this, and you know, try to get the word out to, you know, hopefully save more lives. And and should people be looking for early early warning signs of, of any kind of tumors, or is it just anything that appears to be unusual to you that you can't figure out? Anything that you know appears to be out of sorts, you know, especially with brain tumors, you know, some of the warning signs mimic that of other, you know, other, you know, other illnesses, uh, headaches, right, nausea, yeah. vomiting, you know, which make treatment and self difficult in diagnosis. Sure. So you know, if you've got any of that, you know, you know, let your doctor know. Hey, you know, could it be a brain tumor? You know, bring it up to him. Yeah, absolutely. Robert, you have to come back next year at this time. Oh, absolutely. For many reasons, because you're a good friend, and it continues to prove that this stuff works. Robert, thank you so much for stopping by. Thanks for having us. Again, there are two main types of brain cancer. Primary brain cancer starts in the brain. Something called metastatic brain cancer starts somewhere else in the body and then eventually moves to the brain. Brain tumors can be benign or malignant. They can cause many symptoms. Some of the most common are headaches, usually worse in the morning, nausea, vomiting, changes in your ability to talk, hear, or see, problems with balance or walking, problems with thinking or memory, muscle jerking or twitching, and numbness or tingling in the arms or legs. No one knows the exact cause of these tumors, and doctors can seldom explain why one person develops a brain tumor and another does not. But if you have any symptoms, talk to your doctor immediately. And that's it for today's In-Depth, where we take a closer look at important stories of the day. But our coverage extends online at baynews9.com. There you can find a link to the Miles for Hope website, in addition to several other brain cancer online resources. <laughs>